Or is this mobility issue a connective tissue issue? Because they have to be addressed differently. And sometimes the responsiveness of the intervention that you do might not have an effect. If it is muscle tone, is it more effective to stretch? If it's connective tissue, do you get an effect by stretching? So we do want to understand what is causing the restriction in mobility in your clients. Now, if we focus on the connective tissue side of hypomobility or joint mobility issues, whether that's hyper or hypo, I want you to understand the components of connective tissue. Yes, this means fascia. Yes, this means the tendons and the ligaments. Uh, your connective tissue is your blood vessels, it's your bones, it's your skin. So everything or a lot of things fall under that connective tissue title. Now, the two most common proteins that you will find in connective tissue is going to be collagen and elastin. Collagen is going to be actually 80% of our tendons, of our fascia, of that connective tissue. It is what gives the the strength is kind of like the scaffolding to our connective tissue. It is that, that bridge that is giving the foundation for which the rest of the tensile strength can be built upon. Now, this is as opposed to elastin, which is another protein that you find in your connective tissue and your tendons, uh, etc. but it's not as strong as collagen. This is where you could find the rubber band element to uh, our connective tissue. It allows it to spring back. And it's really a balance between both of these that allows you to move properly. So collagen and elastin. A majority of your connective tissue is made of collagen. Now to understand collagen, which is again is 80% of our connective tissue, the collagen is the scaffolding and the collagen is the strength. We want to understand the types of collagen that are found within our connective tissue. Now, most of that collagen is actually going to be type one. That's the most prevalent type of collagen that is found in your connective tissue. This is what's giving it a majority of its strength. So each of the fiber fibrils are thicker, they're stronger. You do still have type two within your connective tissue and in your tendons. But what's interesting is that you actually find type two more, more in association to the tendon bone insertion. And then type three, type three is actually going to be thinner. So you could think of it as uh, more fragile in a sense. This is what's initially laid down when you have a injury to the connective tissue or to the tendons. And that means that it's obviously associated with scar tissue. When you have a higher ratio or concentration of type three versus type one, that tendon or connective tissue is quote unquote uh, weaker or more susceptible to injury under load. So an example of where you start to see this deviate is that when you, uh, let's say you start to get plantar fasciitis, you're moving dynamically and you start to stress the bottom of the foot and you, you don't have as much elasticity to that connective tissue, you start to micro tear it. So then that micro tearing is happening to the collagen fibers. Yes. Collagen fibrils, fibers. Um, and then it's being repaired and it's type three that gets laid down. Now, when type three gets laid down, it gets laid down in a very uh, messy way, like a, a haystack almost. And then that haystack being uh, disorganized type three collagen fibers is then what you can start to call some of the stickiness that I use to explain to patients is kind of like a scar tissue. Now, how you start to get type three into type two has to do with some of the remodeling and how you stress it. Um, eccentrics is a really good way to reorganize type three collagen fibers into a more organized type one fiber. And more on that later. So now when you're thinking of your clients or your, your patients, 
is if we take hypermobility just in general. So how do you understand what is normal levels of hypermobility? And then where does it start to exceed just a little bit higher where it's more clinical? Um, the most common type of clinical hypermobility would be Ehlers-Danlos. So when does it become that extreme where you're suspecting that maybe your, your client or patient has Ehlers-Danlos? Um, or when is it just kind of generalized? Is it normal? Are they they just were a dancer or a gymnast when they were younger, so now they're very flexible. So we want to understand this a little bit more and then be able to guide our clients. And then where I find this also really important is when it has to do with children. So when you're assessing children for their mobility, when does it become too much mobility, a hypermobility that potentially makes them susceptible for injuries very early on, or potentially early joint and skeletal stress that is creating maybe premature arthritis in a child. So if we look at joint-specific hypermobility, this is where we're seeing excessive range of motion when we compare it to an average, right? That could be age, sex, ethnic group. Females, uh, just in general, are more quote-unquote flexible or hypermobile have more elasticity to their connective tissue than male counterparts. Children also have a higher elasticity and hypermobility compared to adults. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the hydration levels within our connective tissue. And then you actually see a higher propensity towards uh, joint hypermobility in the lower extremities versus the upper extremities. So how are we going to screen our clients and our patients. So testing hypermobility, the way that this is generally done when you look in a clinical setting or at research studies is there's four main ways that you want to assess. You never want to do it just subjectively and, you know, oh, can you do the splits there for your hypermobile, right? We want to be a little bit more um, ob objective on that. So the first one that I'm gonna go over, this is the one that's probably the most common. You might not even realize that you're actually doing a bait and test when you ask your clients uh, or patients if they can do this. But if you can, five, five things here, if you can dorsiflex your fingers beyond 90 degrees, I'm gonna go forward so you can actually see it. Um, so you can see here, that's right? So you're, can you extend the fingers beyond 90 degrees? Can you bring your thumb to your forearm? That's probably the most common um, known one, this number one, where you're bringing the thumb back. And then the third, can you hyperextend your elbow uh, greater than 10 degrees? Can you hyperextend your knee greater than 10 degrees? And then can you reach down and flex and um, touch the floor without touching uh, or without bending the knees? So all of these, you're looking at what's again called the Baton test. If you're scoring four or greater, then that is quote unquote hypermobility. Now, if it's to an extreme and you start to see other characteristics of connective tissue disorders, um, which we'll speak about soon, that typically uh, represents where they're bruising easily. So when people bruise very easily, that often is really telling you a lot about their vascular integrity bruising and being able to rupture or uh, lose the integrity of your blood vessels is a connective tissue uh, presentation. And then thin skin, if you can kind of pull it in, it has maybe a higher elasticity. I'll show you some pictures in a moment, not to freak you out with them. Um, and then also scarring very easily as well um, can often present as something that would be a little bit more clinical. So that would be the first one, that's the Baton. Now, the second one that's actually a little bit more prevalent when you're trying to rule out lower extremity hypermobility is what's called the Lower Limb Assessment Score or SCALE. Um, this is something that for, for those that have signed up for the course, you will get the full uh, printed PDF so you can kind of check off what you see with this to to find the score of your client or your patient. So that document is uploaded on the Teachable platform. Um, but with the lower limb assessment score, why this is good is because the Baton, if you look at this, what's interesting is that 
a majority of the tests for the baton are actually upper extremity. But if we look at this, it says hypermobility is more prevalent in the lower extremity than the upper extremity. So that doesn't really make sense, which is why this lower limb assessment score is actually a little bit more reliable when you're looking at lower extremity specific. So you're, of course, looking at hip flexion, hip abduction. You're looking at the knee, hyperextension, anterior drawer. If you don't know what that is, that's a ACL test where you essentially are taking the tibia and trying to translate it forward. It's a screen for ACL injuries, um, knee rotation, ankle dorsiflexion, ankle anterior drawer. It's thinking very similar. So ankle anterior drawer is an ankle ligament um, test where you're essentially pulling the talus forward or the, the foot forward relative to the tibia. Uh, of course, inversion, midfoot, and first MPJ. So you're scoring all of those. And then a score that is uh, equal to or greater than seven would be a quote unquote hypermobility. And then do you want to assess a little bit further for uh, perhaps some genetic propensities for clinical hypermobility? Ankle lunge test, so this is something that is um, done a lot. A lot of people will use this as a, um, as a mobility drill. Uh, we just actually had something posted on the EBFA channel related to this, but an ankle lunge test, again, this is one joint specific. So I actually don't like this as a diagnostic tool because you're looking at only one joint. Whoop, I apologize. Um, you're only looking at one joint, but really you're measuring what is the distance of the toes from the wall and then the angle of the tibia. So it's two things. So if you do use this ankle lunge test as an ankle mobility assessment, make sure that you're doing both, that you're not just measuring how far from the tibia. Also make sure that they're not massively pronating into the rear foot and midfoot to get the knee forward. That would be uh, a cheating, <laughs> cheating approach to this. So you do wanna make sure that they're staying neutral as they go forward. And then, like I said, that you're um, assessing both. Now, this is the last hypermobility assessment that you can do or incorporate. This is one that uh, is actually very prevalent within podiatry and foot-based research. It's um, used as a outcome measure in a lot of research studies. It's a foot posture index. And you're essentially looking at the rear foot and the forefoot. You give it a score, and then you're determining off of that score how supinated or pronated the foot is. Um, again, for those who signed up for this course, you will have a link to the foot posture index in the Teachable platform. So make sure that you download that and then you can actually use that in your clinical setting to score and actually use it as something um, objective for your clients or patients. So this score, just so you understand a little bit of the scoring, you have a score and you'll see the sheet if you have negative numbers based off of the positioning of the forefoot and the rear foot, negative is going to mean supinated. So a minus 12 would be a super supinated foot. And then a positive number would actually be a pronated foot. So a positive 12 would be a very pronated foot. What's interesting that I wanna point out, which is why I'm showing you the numbers, is what's considered neutral according to the foot posture index is a score of zero to a positive five. So do you notice the positive? So the positive five, positive, positive means pronation, which means that there is a normal amount of pronation in the foot. So a normal, neutral, normal doesn't mean anything, neutral foot is actually slightly pronated. How about that? So that is something super, super important to understand when it comes to the foot. So if we think of this, if you're looking at and you're screening in your clients or patients, just to recap, you can look at the baton, that's the thumb to the forearm, that's looking at how far they flex the fingers back, can they touch the floor, can they hyperextend their knees and their elbow? Do you wanna do a more specific lower limb assessment scale? And you're looking at that. Do you wanna do a foot posture index or do you wanna do the ankle lunge test? right? It's, it's your, your choice off of that. And then based off of the results, you have to make the decision of what you want to do. 
if you do see that they have hypermobility, do you want to help them learn to work more appropriately within their joints? Or if it is very high within the scale and they don't know that they have a clinical hypermobility, do you want to explore that with them? It would be really a rheumatologist that works with with patients such as this. And the clinical hypermobility that you would actually be ruling out is Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, it's an autosomal dominant trait, so it's dominant, which means that if you're looking at how this passes through families, is that if you have someone who has EDS, is what we'll, we'll call it for, for short, EDS, 50% chance that child is going to get an EDS characteristic as well. When you look at children who have EDS, a lot of them have hypotone. So they're, they're born very low tone. Um, they're a little bit slower or later to walk and hit some of their milestones. They're gonna be very flexible. Um, they actually bruise easily. And again, similar scarring that I had mentioned. And then the children will characteristically complain about cramps, like Charlie horses in their legs at night a lot. Um, and a lot of that has to do more with some of the muscle, muscle being kind of on this hypotone and being stretched and the stress that it does to the, to the uh, lower leg muscles. Now, if you look at the classification of EDS, we do not go into all of these, but there are 13 types of EDS. The most common is hypermobile EDS. When you're looking at hypermobile EDS, right? So just hypermobility, Think of it as clinical hypermobility or joint specific hypermobility, or you just don't understand where it is, but they, they scored kind of high on some of those mobility assessments that we just went over. Your concern as a movement specialist should be, what is the stress from an orthopedic and movement perspective for these clients or these patients? Yes, they're going to have joint hypermobility because of the ligaments and the tendons and the fascial system. If you have that much hypermobility in a joint, the chances of you dislocating joints is going to be very high, of course. Because you have so much stress and you're moving through the joints in a uh, not ideally centered position, you're going to start to stress it. That's going to create inflammation into the joints. That's the effusion. So you get to start to get joint uh, fluid inflammation that gets trapped within the joint capsule. You can also get joint instability, which kind of parallels a little bit with hypermobility. And then of course, you're not on the joint surface the right way. So your risk of osteoarthritis or degenerative joint disease is going to be higher. Now, flat feet, pes planus, flat feet, is by far one of the most common foot imbalances that you will see associated with EDS and with a lot of hypermobility. We see it a lot in children. And these children, unfortunately, are told by their pediatricians that they will grow out of it. But a lot of these children don't because they're not being screened by the pediatrician or if they're seeing a podiatrist for actual hypermobility. If they have a true hypermobility or a quote unquote ligament laxity is what kind of a layman's term would be as well, and they're, that's not being addressed, then this is very much setting them up for a future of potential joint stress, joint pain, uh, and overall musculoskeletal pain. So we do want to understand this. We do want to make sure that we are screening them the right way. Now, from a podiatry perspective or a flat feet perspective, if you're seeing a child with flat feet, not pancake feet, very different, a, a baby or a child that has no arch does not mean that they have hypermobile flat feet and they're overpronating. To have a, a pancake foot as a baby, that's normal because our arch does not develop until around eight years old. So that's normal. But to have where you're severely collapsing and you can actually see their talus falling down into this medial collapse and they're, it's called a, a talonavicular joint subluxation or you're uncovering the talar head, all of those do need to be addressed or that child is potentially setting themselves up for uh, a future of pain. Other thing that you will see in children that have hypermobile flat feet is 
bunions. So juvenile bunions. If you see a bunion in a baby, although not literally, <laughs> it would not be literally in a baby, but in a young child, juvenile hallux valgus or juvenile bunions is always in conjunction with hypermobile flat feet. What do you do for these children? One, you get them into orthotics. This is a UCBL and it is used for hypermobile flat feet in children. I will start using this for children that are around hmm, two to three years old is the earliest, earlier than two years old just in my opinion, does it make sense? Um, children typically don't achieve a proper heel toe gait until around three years old. You know, some children are early walkers and things like that, so you do want to accommodate for that. But as soon as they're in a normal heel toe gait, then you can start to use any of these orthotics. The UCBL, what's very unique about this is just picture any arch support that you can get you know, whether over the counter from a podiatrist, what's different with the UCBL is do you see these walls on other si either side of it? So those are called flanges. So this is a medial flange and a lateral flange. And what the flange does, particularly the medial flange, let's say this is a right UCBL, the medial flange acts like a wall so that the tailor head cannot slide down and essentially ab adduct and plantar flex into the midfoot. So you essentially are keeping the talus over the navicular or the midfoot where it needs to be. If that was confusing, I apologize. <laughs> You're essentially blocking the arch from dropping, remembering that the arch is actually your navicular and your talus in that relationship. So it acts like a wall, like a buttress. It does not let it move. In um, adults, with hypermobile flat feet and those adults that have the same tailor navicular kind of subluxation that is characteristic of certain uh, flat feet, they also will need a medial flange. If you have a client or you yourself have severe midfoot pronation and you've tried orthotics and you still don't feel control, you probably did not have a flange. So this the flange. In a child, it's higher because um, a child's foot is, a lot of the child's foot is actually cartilage still. Not all of the bones have formed, but that's something that you'd want to do. Other thing that you can do is you can do a surgical procedure, but before you throw the computer, because I mentioned surgery, <laughs> is the arthroresis. It, it is, it's a very good procedure. I'll tell you why I like it. In children that have hypermobility, hypermobile flat feet, is that it's not a joint fusion, it's a very simple surgery, and it's essentially like an internal orthotic. That's the best way that I ex can explain it. So what it does is, this is the implant. You can see it looks like a screw, almost, right? It's like a plug. And it's going into the uh, subtalar joint, and it's blocking the subtalar joint so you can still supinate and pronate, but it blocks it after a certain period. So when you try to pronate too, too much past a certain point, then it acts like a wall. So it's actually a really good procedure in the appropriate um, patients. The recovery period is super minimal. It's You're really just waiting for skin to heal because there's no bone that's disrupted from it. It's not a fusion, right? So you don't need to be immobilized and let bone heal. Um, but this is something great. And then this doesn't limit the child to, you know, very specific types of shoes that the UCBL has to fit in. This just makes it a little bit more realistic. Adults can get this as well. Um, it's typically not done as a sole procedure in adults because there's usually just more deformity that needs to be fixed and there's more body weight. It's really uh, was initially intended for children. And then of course, what else you can do for those with hypermobility is bring in proprioception, bring in that sensory side. So if you have, picture anyone who, who has, um, very flexible and loves to be in yoga, right? They're very passive 
in their joints. They love to do yoga and splits and things that just really uh, feed into their joint flexibility, but they have really poor proprioception. Now, the reason why someone with joint hypermobility and ligament laxity, which again is a lay term, but ligament laxity is telling you that the proprioceptive stimulation that we get from ligaments, this is the way that it works. So you get proprioceptive stimulation from ligaments, typically when they're towards their end stretch. So you have ankles on the outside of your ankle, uh, ligaments on the outside of your ankle. And when you're about to sprain your ankle, right, you're pulling on the ligament. When you get towards that end stretch, you then stimulate the proprioceptors, which goes into the nervous system, stimulates the brain. You get a stretch reflex. It's, all these things are working in conjunction. But it's triggering the neuromuscular response to correct that area and to protect the joint. If you have ligament laxity and you don't get that end stretch trigger, then you are going to move past the joint of stability within a a joint, and then that's where you could injure yourself. You could sprain your ankle easily. You could uh, fall down easily. You could feel clumsy because you're just not getting that feedback, which means that we have to rely on other uh, proprioceptive input mechanisms Naboso being one of them, Naboso stimulating the nerves in the bottom of the feet, which are actually faster than nerves on the side of the ankle, you then get a faster uh, response time and a more accurate foot awareness and joint awareness response. So by far any um, patient or client with ligament laxity, hypermobility, Uh, history of ankle sprains, diagnosed with EDS, should be using Naboso insoles or doing rehab on the Naboso mats. And I'm not saying that from a biased way. I'm literally just saying that from the efficacy of these products and how they address the proprioceptive void of some of these hypermobile issues. So now when we go beyond,